Hello, welcome to NCFC 9320 Group podcast. Uh, this afternoon, I'm absolutely delighted to have with us ex-referee Keith Hackett, as well as uh, our normal studio guest, uh, Riz. Thank you for joining us, Keith. It's been it's absolutely a pleasure. Delighted uh, to be on the show. Uh, I mean, I've obviously had some very happy hours uh, refereeing Manchester City. Uh, of course, uh, in my era, we were at Main Road. <laughs> yeah, let, let's not talk about 1981 FA Cup final replay. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, both teams served up some terrific football. Um, you know, I've got two, I obviously got several memories of it. Uh, the look on Tommy Hutchinson's face when he's, the ball deflected off him and it, it went in the net. I think he could have died in that moment. The Mackenzie goal, which, you know, we all talk about Ricky Villa's goal, but Mackenzie's goal was something really, really special. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, whilst I remember Ricky Villa's goal, the, the, the real nice touch um, was John Bond, who was a bit vociferous, um, would get in your face, um, and he came straight off the bench and thanked me for my participation in the final. I thought that was... Despite he was on the losing side, I thought that was really magnificent. That that just shows uh, not just the mark of John Bond, but the you know the the honesty and integrity of of yourself, uh, you know, as a referee. What was it like to see Ricky Vier go live and? Uh... Yeah, well, uh, the thing it, it summed up football for me because that first game. He was substituted, and I, I remember even refereeing the match, I could see him walking around the perimeter of the fence, totally and utterly dejected. You know, they talk about a lack of passion of players, but here was massive passion. He was dejected. Uh, and, and amazing, isn't it, that the, a few days later at the, at the replay, he scores a goal like that, that everybody remembers, everybody refers to. And I think it's great, because that's what we love football, don't we? We want to talk about players, uh, you know, and, and I've been very fortunate. I mean, I, I went on the Football League list around about 1972. I came off in 95 and managed to referee loads of people, top class players around the world, but also meet some really nice people. And when I truly think of Manchester two nice people I always remember uh, okay uh, is Bernard Halford who yeah. sadly passed away last year Bernard was Manchester City he made you welcome uh, if he was unhappy he'd tell you in straight away he wouldn't have hesitate no no punches put you know pulled uh, I can remember going to Main Road on one occasion and it was like concrete they got a, a, like a plastic tent um, but it had leaked or a condensation had gone down the, the side and, and it was ice. And Bernard said to me, Keith, we've got to play this game. Uh, you know, if, if you're going to call it off, you'll need to speak to Swales first because he's not happy. If you call it off, he'll, be, he'll go berserk. And I said, and I, I go, what's the problem? He said, well, we've got a slight cash flow problem. You know, we ain't got any cash. We've got the money, we've got the value, but... The chairman is a bit light on cash at the moment. Uh, so it's the gate that's going to play the players. And um, it was those sort of things that, you know, he said, OK, we're going to play. And we played, you know, and, and little, a few people knew that. It, it never got in the press, but th that's the reality of, of the game then compared to how it is now. It just, just shows you that, you know, the, the, the changes in... In, in mentality as well, you know, as well as a uh, like, like scenarios like that. Do you, do you think games like that would get called off now, or do you think you think? Oh, I mean, I I see games getting called off for anything now. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I've refereed with snow on the pitch. Uh, I can remember one Sunday morning refereeing at uh, St James's Park, and uh, that game should never have been played. I it mean, snows in the summer there, doesn't it? Oh, it, I'm telling you, I got there on Sunday morning. They were playing Sunderland, so it was a massive match. I walked across the pitch and I've gone, it's off. 
And um, then the assistant chief constable came in and said, Mr. Hackett, you can't call it off. We've got 50 odd thousand in, in the center of the city. They've been here since yesterday. He said, uh, if you call it off, it's going to cause absolute mayhem. And uh, I liaised with the Football League and eventually <laughs> I said, OK, then fine. Uh, the groundsman was nearly crying because he was saying I was a joke. Kevin Keegan followed me down the steps and he said I was a joke. He was the manager in Newcastle at the time. I said, look, uh, speak to the chief constable. We're having to play this for a given reason and just get on with it. And we would never have played that game. No, I mean, not normally it's a, it's snowing. We'll just give you an orange ball now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, an orange yeah. orange ball game on. But and a lot, a lot of people don't realise that it's the circumstances, not necessarily on the pitch. You know, it's a now it's the surrounding areas. Like you know, if it's a treacherous round the grounds and stuff like that, yeah. it seems like referees are forced to make a decision not to, not to play it now. But like like Riz just touched upon there. Uh, now we're seeing games called off with a. Uh, Covid related yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. What's your What's your thoughts on the, uh, you know, like Klopp, etc. Well, you know? well, I, I think first of all, what amazes me is this: that the Premier League is run by the twenty clubs. They're the shareholders. They have a management team that they put in place. Uh, you know, my office when I was boss of the PGMOL was at the Premier League, uh, so I saw these people dashing around, and it, it seems to me that. If they sit around and they're going to set a regulation, that's got to be very specific, very clear. Everybody understands it. It's transparent. Fans are aware of what it what it is. What's the criteria? And then everybody hopefully adheres to it. And that it then stops any negative sort of vibes going out in the media. One manager saying, I don't want it. I just look and I think there's been some cancellations. Tactically, it's... It's been the right thing for that club rather than actually exactly the amount of COVID. You know, we're not daft, are we? We're all fans. After all, we all no. love the game and we want a game you, to take place. Do you not think it's how we are at the moment as a as a as a human race is that we don't use common sense. We're always trying to get one over on people. We're always trying to, you know, bend the rules and make, you know, find a loophole. I mean uh, I mean, it's like the, the way I look at it is like when, you know, like when the war's on or something like that, and we all get together and everything. Yeah. You know, there don't seem to be any of that anymore. There seems to be no common sense, you know, unless it's written down in black and white. And when yeah. it is written down in black and white, people will try and twist it and just make it benefit them instead of just sort of like playing to the, you know, the gentleman's rules, if you like. And, yeah. you know, and we don't seem to do that anymore. And I think that's the same with refereeing decisions and stuff. We have to have it pigeonholed and written in black and white else otherwise somebody will try and bend that rule well i mean I, I, you're absolutely spot on I, I i think i think fear runs through the game at the moment in those areas i think there's there's people who own clubs that don't like to lose whereas you know going back you had a chairman win lose a draw whatever that was uh they'd occasionally come in and, and thank you for for being at the game you know, from a refereeing point of view, I mean, I, I just generally think that we're, we're, I sometimes think, can we get any worse? I mean, I, I see what, a, what I would consider basic decisions that you would expect a referee in the park make, that they get wrong. And you're suddenly going, you know, I mean, like last week, Jota, I mean, he fell over. Uh, the goalkeeper didn't commit a foul. The referee said it's not a penalty kick. And then some idiot who's a referee, who comes from Sheffield, is in the room <laughs> at Stockley Park saying it's a penalty kick. When anybody with any, an ounce of common sense goes, yeah. no, it's not. And for the first time, well, on a rare occasion, um, we've seen Dermot Gallagher, who's the mouthpiece of the PJMOL, the, the organisation, so coming out and actually saying, yeah, we did make a mistake. And I'm thinking, wow, it, it, must, it must have been an hanging job for the referee. But... There's no accountability. You know, in my day, uh, I, it was done behind the scenes, but if a referee uh, didn't perform well, he'd be off. Yeah. Um, you know, he, 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 wouldn't get the, he wouldn't get games. They'd say, go away. And, you know, and I'd, you know, the referee would moan and whatever. But now we see a referee have a poor performance. 
And unlike a footballer who has a poor performance and isn't picked next week, he gets picked almost the following day. I mean, yeah. it, that, that common was, sense is the that, right word. That was that's one of the points I was going to make, Keith. Uh, I think a few few weeks ago, I forget what match it now. I, it could have been Darren England doing the VAR. Um, he, he got an ab- he got an absolute. He made a boo boo in, in VAR. And then later on in the afternoon, is actually the official somewhere in London, uh, yeah. and it's like, and, and he made yeah, a yeah. he made a, a shocking. It, look, refer, referees are there to be shot at, but what one thing, unless I'm mistaken, is <laughs> they're, not, they're it, not they're not meant to be shot at, Andy. They shouldn't be. They should be. They, they should be. They should be pretty much invisible. Really, a good yeah. referee for me is is invisible. Yeah, but what um, what what we're seeing, what, what we, Riz, what we're seeing now though is. You know, a referee makes an honest, honest call on something. Like, for instance, like the like the the Jota, the Jota one. What what Keith mm. just said, he'll he'll make a decision that was not a penalty. Next minute, soon as that comes out, and he's asked the referee, oh. no matter what referee it is, has to go over to the monitor. You know that decision is going to be overturned. I've not yeah. I've not seen one referee yet actually go actually. I've seen it, and I still don't think it's a, a penalty yeah, or a red card, etc. And I, I'm in the I'm in the mindset now. I'm actually feeling sorry a little bit for referees now because they're being micromanaged unfairly, and yeah. you know they're scared of making a decision now. Well, yeah. I think that the current crop of referees are a reflection of their boss. I think Mike Riley uh, <laughs> wants them to referee like Mike Riley refereed. And, and I was his coach at one stage and also Mike Riley's boss. I, I was always amazed when I decided to retire uh, and move to the Premier League as their referee ambassador that this guy was selected for the job. Uh, because I, I'm thinking, well, he's got zero personality. And, and to some degree, uh, we've seen that. We've seen that as a reflection. I mean... If we, if we talk in detail about VAR, I, I have really major concerns. I think, first of all, there's no level of accountability. So let's say that we, we understand that incident uh, involving Jota and, and involving the goalkeeper, and they've got it wrong. It seems to me that what I tried to encourage was communication. You know, I had the referee working with the same assistant week in, week out. And I used to say to a, to the referee, you get it wrong, your mate gets it wrong, your team's got it wrong, so your team will suffer. And I meant that. I meant by simply saying, I'd phone them up and saying, I think you've made a hash of that. Uh, let's discuss it. We'd discuss it through, and then I'd say, you're not out next week. You know, it's as simple as that. You're not out. With one or two, I dropped them. You know, yeah. people like Andy Durso, I, I just said, you, you're not, you're not of the quality that I'm, I was seeking at the Premier League level. And so it seems to me that the only way they're going to resolve this is to have, have teams of officials. And by that, I would like to see Stockley Park shut like tomorrow yeah. because there's no accountability. And I don't know. I just, get, I just get the impression that there's somebody standing over these guys at VAR and they're actually saying this is what it's going to be. I get the impression that somebody sat down with these referees and said, uh, if it goes to the screen, we're going with a VAR, whatever. Do you mean like Sir Alex Ferguson, our club, <laughs> stood over? Yeah, I mean, I just, yeah, I, 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 what, I, what I want is, I, I think that, you know, the test of a referee is when you walk across from uh, from the, the the dressing room to the car park and the car that you, you you're gonna go in and on the way they tell you either you for real do you need my glasses all those sort of anecdotes that you can always refer to or oh, well done ref yeah occasionally well done I mean but see what happens is the referee Kevin Friend who made that call. The, uh, as the referee, he said it was not a penalty kick, so he was right. Then yep. he goes to the screen, and he's automatically said, well, I must have got it wrong. 
or, and, or was it or was he told you have to overturn this? Well, I, I I think I think I think like you, I'm on the same I'm on the same wavelength. I think that they go to the screen. We've got to understand that the guy who runs the PGMOL in the first place in the Premier League didn't want the monitors. And then somebody said, you've got to have the monitors because that's part of the IFAB protocol. And for the first few weeks of last season, you're saying, well, are they going to use it? And, and so the media asked Mike Riley, when are you going to use the, the monitor? Are you making use of the monitor? Yes, we're going to use it sparingly. That was his answer. Yeah. Three times in 380 games, they used it. So now we look at this season, and it's obvious, it's, it's blatantly obvious that when VAR comes in, the referee's saying, right, I'm going with the VAR. I'm not even going to stick. I'm not even going to argue that I've got it right, or have. You know, I've, I don't see the difference between a player coming up to me, having, I, I've given a penalty kick, and he's saying to me, you can't help them wrong. And me saying to the player, well, I've seen you kick the ball over the, over the crossbar, mate, when you should have put it in the net. Yes. So if you think I'm wrong, I think you were wrong as well, missing the goal. Yeah. Yeah. So I you'd have an answer, but, but now I think there isn't an answer. And so the referee goes in one direction. And I just wonder whether he has a conversation with the guy who's put him in jail. Because Craig Pawson put Kevin Friend in jail. Yep, absolutely. And ultimately, at the end of the day, Friend takes the, the bait. Now, what, I'm, what, I, I'm, what I'd like to see is a little bit like they do in the MLS, majority of the MLS, and that is the VAR is actually in the stadium, in a room, or is on the broadcast van. And so when it's all finished and the manager wants to have a, a genuine discussion. And by the way, I said, when I, again, I set the system up, 30 minutes after the game, the manager can knock on the referee's door and ask the question and get clarification. Um, but see, often, I think what's happening now is when that takes place, the referee goes, right, you see, Mike Dean, it's him up, it's at Stockley Park, mate. Don't talk to me. Mm. So there's no outlet. Whereas if the if the VAR suddenly comes down into the referee's dressing room at the end of the match and they're all in that room and there's a debate, there's clarification and then there's justification of why they made that call. And they can leave that stadium saying we got it right or we got it wrong. I think I think now I think now, Keith, it's uh when when a decision, a V a VAR decision is made, not a referee's decision, but when they go over, I think it's well known now that the referee is being told this is what you're going to do this is the decision you are going to make rather because like it like i touched upon earlier i've not seen one referee go no. to a monitor yet and come away and go no i'm no. sticking by my guns i still we, don't think it was a penalty we know don't we if we're not daft are we? we're in a stadium i mean uh, see i think that what i want to hear uh, and that is i want to be able to listen to the referee and the VAR. Yeah. I want to hear that conversation. I want, I want, there's no, see, look, whatever we think, and I've been answering like social media uh, comments in recent weeks, because what I really fear is that what is incompetence, which is incompetence in referee, errors that are made because they're human, are now slanting where fans, genuine fans, I'm beginning to think, just a minute, um, Corruption. they're on the make here. Corruption. The integrity, it's not, they're not being real here. They're dishonest and all that. Well, I want to somehow assure you that that's not the case. I mean, there are sufficient systems in place that can check every decision and interrogate every decision, right, in order to hold the integrity of our officials. But... To be able to put balance into it, the ultimate decision maker who takes responsible for the game is the referee. And I'd be saying to the group of referees, almost what I said to the referees years ago, who do you think are the best two linesmen assistants that you want to work with? 
And if Howard Webb said to me at the time, it's Darren Cannon, it's Mike Malarkey. And I, I said, right, OK, every time you have a game, Howard, they are going to be with you. They're your team. They're your assistants. You develop good practice. This is no different to having, to having two forwards. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like De Bruyne, isn't it? I mean, you just watch him. He doesn't even have to think about or even look. He just passes that ball 50 yards onto the onto the foot of a of a colleague. Because he trusts where, where his team's going to be. And that, and that trusts. Is ab- absolutely. Exactly yeah. that. Absolutely. And that's what you have to do with refereeing. You, you know, you they get dragged out of position because you can see they don't trust the referee. There's the assistant referee who's a qualified referee. Okay, he's a, he's a skilled assistant. And he's there and he, he's not doing anything anymore. I don't see him raise the flag, only this delayed flag. And I'm thinking, I know that we had the very best assistant referees in the world. Not everyone, but generally a large number of quality assistant referees who are now being made to look like dummies. Yeah. Because Keith. I know why there's a delayed flag, but we're getting delayed flags when it shouldn't be delayed because the yard's offside. So, look. And let's not forget. We can't be happy for- with VAR. Let's not forget as well with, with the delayed flag, Keith, as well. I've said this for a while now. It drives me mad because with that delayed flag, you could also get a serious injury with a player. You know, we, we know it's offside. If the flag's being delayed, a defender or attacker could clash or goalkeeper or whatever, and a serious, serious injury could occur when the, the linesman could have just put the flag up and it's done. I went to a game, listened in, I went, we're gonna have that, you know. And yeah. and I think and I think that's how it that's how it should be. I just I think I think when you've got communication like where where we can all as fans understand what you're doing, it, it makes the referee more human, you know, because you just see the referee as running around in the middle of the pitch, ruining it for you. You know, yeah. when it's yeah. disallowing goals, giving yeah. it all, and all if you can see how you've got to that decision. You might not agree with that decision, but you kind of think, yeah, I can see that. I can see why he's given that. I and mean, I, I, to sum it up, a few years ago, I saw, I was watching a rugby game on television, an international, and uh, what this player, this brute of a player, puts in one hell of a charge on his opponent and knocks him, and ba- the kid bounced about three times. I mean, it, the crowd went, ooh, and the touch judge flag went up and everything. And, and then they, they're going to have a review. And, and the referee, and it might have been Nigel Owens, comes to the middle of the pitch, as they do. They, they, the big screen's on. We now are listening in. The two judge judges are saying, look, the guy's committed a real offence. He's got to go. He's got to go. And he goes, well, wait, TMO, let's listen in. So that he looks at it. And it's in slow motion and it looks horrendous. And I've gone, he's going here. And the referee said, could you play that at normal speed? Exactly. Could you play that at normal speed? And he played it at normal speed. And he just turned and said to his two colleagues, it's rugby, mate. Get yeah. on with it. That was it. Yeah. And, and sometimes we try to make... Um, you know, big scenarios. I, I mean, I'll not get into the detail, but I was talking to a club this week where they had a player yellow carded in a game. It was a reckless challenge. It was a yellow card, right? And they asked, they asked my advice. They asked for my view. And I said, look, this is a yellow card. It's a yellow card because the challenge is reckless. It's, it's not endangered the safety. It's not endangering the safety of an opponent. It's reckless. And, um, and that now, what they're trying to do is they're trying to upgrade that that yellow card to a red. And and he said, "How do we approach it?" I said, "Well, ask them which particular law that they are referring to that makes them believe that that should be a red card." Yeah, and, it and ask ask the second question that you ask is this: Who has decided on that 
that row, rat row, is that an ex-referee or is that an administrator that I've got two apath announce about what is a foul and what is not a foul? Yeah. And, and therefore, the game, I, I said to somebody the other week, you know, if, if you take somebody like Manchester City as a club, right, so whoever they play, it doesn't matter. They do, they've got all the technical backup and all the staff to recognise their opponents, the changes tactically and all the things that go. The one thing they don't do, these clubs, is employ a referee. And I'm not looking for a job, but they could have somebody like Mark Elsey or some, somebody similar who, who they could say, right, we've got this referee this week. What do you think? Or even in the game process, what do we need to do? Because, you know, I mean, I'd probably sit with Arsenal uh, and say to that manager, once Zaka has got his yellow, first yellow card, I'd be saying to him, you need to take him off, mate, because he's lost it now. Yeah. He's yeah. Got, you know, and look at the number of red cards he's had. Now, I can remember a few years ago, uh, going to Everton when David Moyes was the manager. I was the boss of the P General. Firmino had, had had uh, 10 yellow cards in 10 games. <laughs> and, I, I know, and I'm saying to referees, I want less yellow cards. Because when I took over, it averaged about five. And I'm saying the optimum in the game for me is three. That's where it used to be. That's where I've got to get it. Uh, and therefore, what I want is you... I don't want you to not yellow card and not red card when appropriate. What I do want is to have a check and balance as to whether you can manage that situation without a yellow card. You know? And, and I mean, that, that, that's right, Keith, because every, everybody thinks uh, a foul is automatically a card. I know. No. no, and referees now fall into that trap. But the other, th the other side of it is this. What really annoys me sometimes is just think of a boiling kettle. And what a, re what a referee's got to ensure is there's no bubbles on the water. A good game has heat in it. it you know, the, the kettle's not boiling, but it's, it, it's uh, if you put your finger in, it might oh, hurt. Yeah. And so in that sense, that's where you want the game to be. But, but what I see is, I see referees failing to recognise that it's beginning to bubble. And they let it go. And the players then take advantage. And then they go and have a cup of tea at half time or whatever the drink is now, isotonic sort of acrylites and, and a heart rate tea from that, and all that. Cup of tea and, from and, that boiling kettle. Oh, and then what they, yeah, what they do then is they come out and they go, yellow card, yellow card, yellow card, yellow card. And you go, what's this about? In the first half, you didn't yellow card. Why are you suddenly going like confetti now? Mm. And, and I used to have the referees, and, and I had big personalities to manage, and they'd come in and say, you, you did three yellow cards there, you could have got away with two. You know, and I think, in a way, it might be the, the way players have changed to some degree. Because, you know, I mean, I, I, I tell a story of, of being at, at the other, across the road at Old Trafford, and Mc, um, Gordon McQueen and George Jordan had just arrived at Old Trafford and I'm, I'm in the middle refereeing and George Jordan had this thing of catching the ball on his arms which was handball and yeah. I've already, I've prejudged it all I've decided if he does that in this game I'm going to give the free kick, I don't care where I am I'm going to give it because it's not allowed and I give the free kick and the expletives that he came out with uh, were, were horrendous so I've gone, let's have a chat. And he, he's lost it a bit. All these expletives. And I've gone, Joe, you're banned from Stringfellas Nightclub next week, mate. <laughs> to me. And he's gone, what? Stringfellas Nightclub. Gordon McQueen. And I said, Gordon, I've told him. My brother in the morning, not a fellow, and he's gone, hack it, are you Johnny? 
and my brother was the director. <laughs> I did go. <laughs> 